three. Someone. Stop the engine, stop the engine. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Great Lakes Center for the Arts. Canadian Brass, thank you for an absolutely wonderful performance just now. And we thoroughly appreciate your willingness to stay on and uh, have a question and answer session with a few students here in the audience, as well as uh, our audience out on the YouTube channel. We'd like to welcome all of you as well. Uh, we have students from several area high schools and uh, universities, and they have some interesting questions for you. So I'm going to turn it over to them and to our audience members online. Please feel free to post your questions and comments. We have someone monitoring that, and we will ask those questions as well. So at this time, I'll come down here and see who might have a question. Maybe we'll have a little prelude just before we Yes, start. absolutely. So it wouldn't have been that long ago that one of us could have been sitting right where you are, a student observing a, a professional group. Uh, it would have been Brandon or Caleb, because they both spent their high school here in Michigan. So this experience is very similar. And maybe you can even imagine yourself one day being on stage and, and doing pretty much what you saw us doing. So, Brandon, maybe you'd like to start and just talk about that experience of growing up here in a rich arts environment, which led one thing to the next. Yeah, just a couple of years ago. Uh, wait, how old was I? Many years ago. Oh, many years ago, yeah. Um, should I mention that it's my birthday in, uh, on Tuesday? That's right. Yeah. Should I mention that? Yeah, not the year, just the month. Not the year, yeah. not the year, okay. Is this mic on? Is my mic on? Do they know that it's this guy talking right now? Okay. <laughs> Keep moving well, your head. Michigan, yes, it's true. I got my education in Grand Rapids and then moved to Kalamazoo for grade school. I moved to Kalamazoo in the eighth grade and studied with uh, the trumpet teacher who was actually here tonight, who made me quite nervous. I felt like I was in high school again uh, in many ways, but uh, he's not actually anyone to get nervous over. He's a lovely guy, Scott Thornburg, and he was um, one of many reasons that inspired me to go into music. I had some terrific uh, music educators in my life, starting with my dad, who plays piano, and he and I uh, went on to play concerts together, and um, Scott Thornburg, my trumpet teacher, my band director at Portage Northern High School, all these people really shaped me early on in really the most important way, and that was to have a love for music and a joy for playing it with others. Um, so I think that that's the, that's the main, uh, that's probably the most important ingredient in all of this, is that uh, you have this, this beautiful, beautiful thing of just having an appreciation for, for what you're getting to do with others and making beautiful music. So that's right, and that, and I think Caleb, spending your uh, two years of high school right near here, Traverse City or Interlaken. Yeah, very, very close by. Um, have any of you been to Interlaken for the summer camp or the academy? Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah so as you know, it's a really special place. And um, the best part about that for me was, just like <coughs> Brandon was talking about, um, it was really an environment where I was surrounded by for the first time, people that kind of had similar goals, who had a similar passion for not just um, music, but the arts, because as you know, it's a multidisciplinary and arts boarding, boarding high school and summer camp. So um, it's really a fantastic place. Um, and I really I cherished my time there. Um, I know we're limited on time, so I wanted to make sure we get to hear your questions. Mm -hmm. um, but before we do, I kind of want to, how many of you are um, high school brass players? High school non-brass players? Okay, cool. <laughs> and um, how many of you are non-high school brass players? <laughs> non-high school non-brass players? Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks for coming. We're happy to be here. Thank you. We'll open it up here in the audience first. Does anyone have a question you'd like to ask? Great. From Michigan Tech. <laughs> I know that a lot of people working a nine to five job tend to hate themselves. So what does your <laughs> average day in the life of a professional musician look like? Nice question, mm -hmm. Achilles. 
because this is the one. Achilles spends most of his time on the beach, so I thought I'd like to hear him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, would you like to hear how it's when we're on tour or when we are not on tour? Both, okay. So, okay. When we're on tour, we usually, actually always, we always take the earliest flight possible. So flights that usually are 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Uh, we arrive at the, at the town <laughs> we're about to play. Sometimes we have to drive uh, after we arrive with the plane. Uh, we, we, we always make sure to have a good, healthy meal. And then we have maybe an hour or two hours max to rest. And then we go to the, um, to the venue, we warm up, uh, we do a sound check, we eat, we perform, and we meet our audience. <laughs> and then we go home, and the next day, repeating this. <laughs> um, now, when we are not on tour, uh, all of us have uh, uh, different things we're doing. I mean, uh, Caleb and... Uh, Jeff teach in some amazing universities, Indiana University and North Texas. Uh, and of course, uh, they do solo stuff and chamber music. The same for me and Brandon too. We also teach uh, in New York. I teach at Brooklyn College and uh, Brandon teaches at Manhattan School, of, uh, Manhattan School of Music. And uh, we practice, we, we go to concerts, we read. Uh, you know, Achilles, I think each one of us has a different... Has a different, yeah. A different day uh, of how much time we spend playing our instrument. I know the smaller the mouthpiece, this is a rule, the smaller the mouthpiece, the more time you have to spend practicing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rule I've just created. <laughs> <laughs> but I think each of us, there's been a period of time in our life where we spent four, five, six, eight hours a day practicing. And I think that as time goes by, that can be shortened. Sometimes if you have a new piece, you still have to put that kind of time in. It really takes that kind of endeavor. But as a group, we like to rehearse six, maybe, maybe six hours a day when we're together. And then individually, Jeff, how long do you practice every day? I try to get in three or four 25-minute sessions. Yeah. <laughs> a day, a week, did you a say? A day? <laughs> <laughs> of VR or of... Yeah, I have a little bit of an Oculus uh, obsession. So I can practice while playing VR. Never mind. <laughs> 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 we get pretty efficient after spending a lot of time in our early years figuring out efficiency and sound production. So there's a lot of maintenance. And then what Chuck's talking about with learning the new music and then memorizing uh, the new music and the steps and the choreography. And now we're spending our time figuring out how to run a microphone and record <laughs> ourselves and <laughs> get the videos. <laughs> intertwined and editing, so there's always stuff for projects. The 9 to 5 thing has a different answer now over the last 8 months than it, does, than it used to for us also. We've got a lot more time on our hands, so uh, I would say that um, many of us probably structure our, our day based on just what needs to be done. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, I've always found it useful to do your most uh, creative thing first. Try to do the thing that maybe you're passionate about first, uh, whether, it's, whether it's practicing or writing music or creating something, um, and then set a, aside time to do some business things, responding emails, some math problems, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really different for yeah, everyone, but we're all, always trying to get whatever needs to be done, we're trying to yeah, account for, for that. For me, I put instruments around the, uh, the house so that it's easy to pick it up and play it for 10, 15 minutes. And if you do that through a day, by the time you're done, if you add it all up, it turns into real hours. And it's a convenient way to play and it's something that you should consider. I think it's often promoted that 15 minutes, 20 minutes of nice practice is really valuable. If you don't have two hours or you don't have the stamina or you don't feel like it, short bursts, short bursts are, are really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we should move on to another question. Yeah, we should probably get another question, but I thought maybe Jared, just, you're the guy that plays all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, um, my, my main gig is in orchestra life, so I play in the Winnipeg Symphony as my main, um, you know, source of income, and then I also teach at the university over there. 
Uh, and our schedule weekly is we have a, a weekend, normally Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday through Saturday is kind of rehearsal um, and uh, performances later in the week. So it's, I mean, I would say, you know, we spend about 20, 20 or so hours in the week rehearsing and performing, and then the rest is, is practicing. And, but it's, it's definitely a different life than uh, some of the lives that uh, these guys live. So do you think we should have another question? No, I changed my mind, actually. That, That's okay. I think one question is probably enough. One question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One at a time. Somebody one else? at a time. One more. Another great question? That was a good one. Um, my question is, what is your advice for high school students going into college looking to play their instrument or looking for scholarships? Because personally, I think I'm the only French horn player in this room. Mm. <laughs> and I play horn. <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> oh, we forget, and, um, we forget about it. It's a rare too. instrument. <laughs> and so looking for college scouts or looking for somebody who's interested in your future playing in college, how would you go about that? Well, that's a horn question probably, too. I don't know how colleges work in your country. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I, te I teach at Indiana University. So it's my 14th year there. And w it's, I th what I was thinking about that previous question and this question is it, during this really unique time of the quarantines and everything, it's hard to, my students are having difficulty doing regular practice. And uh, so it's good to have these projects and to have real fear, <laughs> good fear, scaring us out of the couch and into the practice room. So it's really setting uh, some little goals and all the obvious stuff that, you, that everybody, I think, is telling you guys of sounding with a good sound and playing musically um, and being teachable. I think at the, if you're talking about actual college audition experience, I think those, the people there in those auditions want to see that you're receptive and into learning while also playing your instruments well. Um, as far as those priorities. And then, yeah, set up your, your time with little tasks. One of the rules is that you can't ever do a project. You only do enough tasks that end up adding together to finishing your project <laughs> or whatever repertoire you're working on. So be a little bit surgical on your prep, I think, is one way. Would she need a, like a solo, like something that really sets a great example, of what, like one piece or two pieces, three pieces? What is it that you audition for? What do you look for? Good, good question. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's what we do at IU is we try and make it as, as flexible as possible. So for our music ed uh, degree, it's one solo, uh, just the exposition, the first part of a Mozart concerto or equivalent, and then two etudes of contrasting styles. And then for the performance majors, it's five contrasting excerpts and a concerto. Hmm. So, because there's lots of schools that are asking for specific things, and we don't want to be, you know, asking for more different specific stuff. So you can double up and use those excerpts. Yeah, what do you do in Texas, Caleb? What's the entrance? What would you expect a player to do to show that they should be accepted to the University of North Texas? Yeah. Um, well, there's definitely certain like repertoire. Usually, it's one or two contrasting solos and etude and scales. But mm -hmm. more importantly is um, it's really important to like reach out to the professors of the universities and just get to know them maybe through a lesson or uh, even through an online Zoom lesson. That's better than nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, just always kind of um, doing your own projects. That's the one thing that I, that I see missing from, from uh, students. It's really rare to find students who are very kind of uh, intrinsically motivated and, and create their own projects and uh, find players to surround themselves with and, and do projects, whether it's recordings or videos or just arranging music and playing it together <coughs> or creating performances outside of school. Uh, because the, the reality is no matter how good your institution is, it's never gonna provide you with enough performance experience. So you kind of have to get out there and, and create your own opportunities. And uh, yeah, so th as soon as you can kind of get past that um, hesitancy to uh, break down that barrier and and, uh, and I think it's going to serve you really well. I like that. I hadn't thought of that before. To, to get to know your potential teacher in advance to make that connection. That's a really, that is a fantastic suggestion to, to start picking out where you think you might want to end up and start making a connection. And really easy to do. They're used to being emailed through the school website. Yeah. And yeah, they're used to I would say they almost expect in. it. They almost expect it, right? Yeah. yeah. Huh. In general, yeah. I mean, it's 
it's not required. I actually need to go do some emails. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> remind me. Great. Another question? I think we have a question from our online audience. I have a question from our Facebook page. The question is, have any of you served in any military musical units slash bands? Military, military. Boy Scouts count? <laughs> I don't think so. Achilles. Well, Achilles didn't have to because he was uh, Greek. And he actually was born on Mount Olympus. He's half, well, you know the story. So <laughs> we protect him because, you know, there's a vulnerability there. But I think we were all just happened to be the, a different age in a different place. Just the right time. So we didn't. But Fantastic opportunities. Uh, that's one uh, really fantastic uh, place. I know in, in Canada we have the uh, the Ottawa the, the the band up in Ottawa, which is terrific, and they they have a nice schedule and uh, lots of opportunities to perform. Uh, often, when people are thinking of all the things you can do, you think of you know orchestras or whatever. But this band has many many more positions for professional uh, engagement. So that's a good question. I've played taps before. Does that yeah. count as an hymn? That'll count. Reveille? I couldn't play Reveille fast enough <laughs> for, for them. Nobody was waking up. It's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. Wait, we should be suspicious. What, where's this question coming from? <laughs> have we been in the military? We have. Okay. We have oh. been sent by the government to many locations. Uh, then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau opened up Canada to what was then the Republic of China, the, the uh, closed society. We were the first Western group in to China as performers. And we definitely represented Canada. Uh, just by virtue of the name, people expected us to represent Canada. So we were on very good behavior and did represent Canada. And we followed it that very same fall. We were in Russia, sent to Russia. And I know that there was a lot of interest. Each of these countries we'd go to, there, the first few days was really them sorting out if perhaps we're there on a mission beyond just playing music. And they discovered very quickly that we knew nothing about politics and nothing about so They were fine, and then it was just concerts. But we were definitely there on that mission of providing concerts and really so to that extent, we have represented the government many, many times. Another question on Great, the I think we have another one from our online audience. And I, I'd like to mention that we have Boyne City High School students. The high school band um, is online and um, eager to learn more as well. Fantastic. Lakin? Yes, so this one is just in from our live YouTube chat box. And it says, hey, Brandon, any anecdotes about Scott Thornburg? Great teacher, by the way. <laughs> Oh boy! Anecdotes about Thornburg. It's it's gonna get personal now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. Well, they can't see you anyway. You got a mask. On. Yeah, I just said goodbye <laughs> to him. So uh, yeah, I know he's not tuning in. We're uh, we should be safe. Um, anecdotes. Well, I would say that probably unknowingly, uh, Scott Thornburg is the person, musician, trumpeter who I learned how to play musically from. Uh, he had an approach to the instrument that was very much like a singer. And I felt when I was in lessons with him that I was just observing somebody making a song-like sound at all times. And I never really felt like I was in a, in a trumpet lesson. And, and he never, to be honest, really worked on any uh, mechanics with me, any really technical things with, well, I guess that explains why my embouchure is messed up. Uh, <laughs> which Achilles pointed out to me before the concert. Um, <laughs> Scott's going to come back. In about so I'm going to have a lesson with Scott Thornburg soon to fix these <laughs> issues. So hopefully in time to play the second concert tonight uh, <laughs> to get through that. But um, I would say that that is my general anecdote. Um, and if you ever sense that, if you can relate in any way, if you ever sense that there's something really special about any of the educators in your life, that they're able to communicate something beyond even the instrument that they're playing, that's usually a good sign if you, if you feel moved by the sounds that they're making. Um, I mean, moved like uh, 
in your a good soul. Way. So not in a good way. Yeah, in a good yeah. way. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for the clarification. Um, that's usually a good sign. Follow that, and uh, that will surely continue to inspire you. How about here in the house? Any other questions? What grade are you in, sir? <laughs> <laughs> they asked what grade he's in. <laughs> it's for Brandon. So after you have uh, finished uh, uh, high school, where did you go to college, and then how did you end up with the Canadian Brass? Uh, yeah, right after uh, studying with Scott, I studied with him from the 8th grade through 12th grade. Uh, and he encouraged me to apply for various schools. I applied for uh, the Cleveland Institute, University of Michigan, Western Michigan, where he still teaches, and the Juilliard School. Not to be confused with Juilliard School or the Juilliard School. It's a different place. Um, where's, where's Caleb's that? also familiar with the Juilliard where's School. That? It's in New York City, and uh, so I auditioned for all of them, and fortunately, somehow, maybe mistakenly, got into all of them. <laughs> uh, so before they could uh, correct the mistake, there I was at the Juilliard School, studying with one of uh, Scott Thornburg's previous teachers, uh, who he studied with at Aspen, Ray Mace. Uh, so uh, that's where I went after high school, was to Juilliard. Uh, and studied with Ray Mace and Mark Gould, uh, and as did Caleb. He had a similar route. Right after interlocking, he came to Juilliard, and Caleb and I overlapped for one year at Juilliard. And during that one year that we over overlapped, um, my senior year is when I started playing with Canadian Brass, um, because I had met them the year prior at the Music Academy of the West, which is a summer program. And uh, we were playing alongside, the students got to play alongside Canadian Brass. And I think the reason, correct me if I'm wrong, I think <laughs> the reason that they, me they remembered me was because I cracked a joke or did something. <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with trumpet playing. <laughs> I don't know, do you, maybe Chuck would, would answer this part better, like how did it come to be, this Canadian Actually, Brass? this is a really good lesson for everybody watching and listening, is what Brandon did is what you always need to be aware of, is you're making contacts. You're, you're meeting people, you're making an impact, and you can then follow up on that if it interests you. And when we met Brandon at the academy, he was uh, the trumpet player at the time in our group. Brandon one time said, I really love brass quintets, and could be, and I don't know your words, but in, this could be something I'd really like to do in my life. If there's ever an opening in Canadian brass, let me know. And for a student to say that head on, it was, you, you don't forget that. And when it came time to look for a trumpet player, he said, well, Brandon has already expressed it. We don't have to wonder if he would like to play in a brass quintet. He's already indicated that. He'd be perfect. Let's, let's, let's bring him in. Let's see how it goes. So contacts, like work, work with everybody you meet has a potential for you in, in some way that you can, you can make that connection and make it work. So that's a really good example. And then this whole time, I thought it was because of my Napoleon Dynamite impression. <laughs> oh, oh good. you should. I c it's been too long. I couldn't Can possibly. Do yeah. Do you want to see him do Napoleon Dynamite? I don't oh, think. Wow. I, they don't even know what Napoleon Dynamite is. <sighs> do whatever I feel like. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was it. Um, and then you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Um, this question is for the tuba players, which I might like to add that it is the best and most superior instrument out there. But um, my question is mainly, do you have any particular artists, not, well, players and pieces that you might recommend for high schoolers who can't find too many? Wow. Three and questions for me in a row? Wow, that's a great <laughs> oh, it's oh, sorry. Yeah, Jarrett. Oh, gosh. Um, so you said players and pieces and things like that? Okay. Um, well, I, you know, Caleb sort of touched on this, but it's so easy to get in touch with anyone nowadays because, because of the, the world that we live in, everyone's sort of been forced to get, you know, a oh, tech setup. I have an idea. What? I have an idea. Jarrett and I have been doing a Thursday. Every Thursday, we talk to some important tuba player. We've talked to Warren Deck, who was in the New York Philharmonic forever, and we've talked to, to Corny, who's in the Chicago Symphony, and just a wonderful list, and it's all on YouTube. 
He lined this up. I, I lined it up. <laughs> no, Jared did, I have to admit. It's all lined up so you can see the people that we talked to. And we tried to stay away from pedantic things like what horn do you play or what model or what kind of mouthpiece and all that. We didn't spend time on that. We spent time on what motivated them to play the instrument, who their model behavior, who did they listen to, and who did, what do they like to do. So I'd say that would be a good source right off, just because the way that Jared arranged it, it's really easy to, to poke that out and take a look. Yeah, you just go on YouTube and you search Canadian Brass Tuba Chats. And what I was saying was that you know you can reach out to any of these people and ask for a lesson. I mean, particular inspirations for me is Oystein Batzweig. He's a Norwegian tuba soloist. And Chuck and I actually talked to him. So you can start there. And he has a, this academy now that you can do online as well. And it's not very expensive to do. So like I said, it's really easy to take advantage of the resources now because there's so many and they're so easy to take advantage of. So I think each of you can do that. I think the trumpet players have talked to some trumpet players. Uh, um, Jeff is on every Friday with, with amazing horn players. Uh, there's so many of them. I mean, horn, it's, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, too many horn players. At any rate. You didn't horn. have to do this when you said amazing horn <laughs> player. That was unnecessary. And some trombone players. We talked to Joe Alessi, famous <laughs> Joe Alessi, the, the New York Philharmonic and Juilliard. He's an important and, uh, tubist, sir. And other yeah. people. So Get yeah, you know, <laughs> what, a, what an era we live in. There's just no, no end to the pot. Lim it's limitless where you can get your influences. Like Arnold Jacobs was, I was lucky enough to study with Arnold Jacobs, but everybody can see Arnold Jacobs, see and hear Arnold Jacobs all over the internet. This was not possible when, well, some people that I knew when they were growing up. Okay, me, it wasn't possible, but now it's, Endless. So just get on the thing, and one will lead to the next, to the next, to the next. You'll hear great, great players. And there's this guy in Canadian Brass who's been, you know, at it for a little while. He's fun <laughs> to listen to. Yeah, but he doesn't accept email. So oh yeah, he doesn't himself. like to teach. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one great question or two? Uh, we ha yes, we have another one online. So this is from a Boyne City High School band student, and their question is. How do you dance and play at the same time, and do you choreograph your own dances? <laughs> dances. We, I don't think we realized we were dancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another instance of just taking advantage of the opportunity when we meet talented people to, to have them come and influence us. Um, at Santa Barbara was a good example. These guys are at Santa Barbara. There are a lot of artists around, and you just pull them, hey, come on and listen to our rehearsal. Give us some, some techniques. You never get too old for advice. Just keep your ears open constantly. And with our, our limited choreography, we always, we had the, the uh, National Ballet, the head of the National Ballet came and coached us, the National Ballet of Canada, so that we, when we do ballet, it's absolutely authentic Canadian well, we try. But anyway, we did have uh, really good advice. We just take it, we, we take the opportunity to grab hold of something, come on in. If, we, if, uh, if we're playing something, and I remember there was a cellist from Japan, Tsutsumi, he was a really fine cellist, and he came and he said, hey, he said to me, he says, you're in charge of the rhythm. How come you're not really taking charge and getting, you know, and he's like a cello player. And so I thought, you know, he's probably a really aggressive cello player. And he's, he's, he was expecting that from the tuba. It was really good advice. And Philip Jones, the famous trumpet player of the Philip Jones Ensemble, he came in and taught us how to play triplets as a group. I mean, we each had our own concept of that. And he would, and so just simple things. You say, hey, what do you think of this? What's wrong or what's right with this? And just to take that. So with the answer triplets? is yes, we do. We get advice, mm -hmm. sometimes bad advice. Well, triplets uh, the fastest you ever ended up playing on it? Ah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty lucky though too, because we get to perform. So we get this laboratory to try things out. Once we get the advice, move it into the show, and then try it and see if it works. But we're listening to the audience too. It's a real shared experience, and it can only evolve if we have another concert the next, hmm. the next day usually. But yeah, so experiment and get out there and perform and set up those performances so you have some good fear to get you to go practice. <laughs> and it's another instance of of. of like Carmen, something that took us months and months to figure out all the parts. Now these guys, when they join the group, they watch a video, bam, like that. They're like, YouTube is just incredible. And we don't have investments in YouTube. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> no. okay. Well, maybe a little. Oh, was there another question in the middle? Yes. One more. 
So I know a few of you have already expressed like how you came into the musical world, but I was just wondering like if you remembered a specific moment in your career that really made you more passionate about music and how you basically chose to go into this arena, I guess. That's a good question for Achilles because he's so passionate. <laughs> what do you think, Achilles? Uh, where were those moments of finding your passion in music and really? Well, for everyone, it, it was different. For me, um, I grew up in Athens, in Greece, and uh, uh, should I say the story? It's going to take three minutes. I'm going to be quick. Um, mm -hmm. When I was 10 years old, my parents took me to a salsa concert of the famous <laughs> Celia Cruz, Queen of Salsa. Uh, she came oh. to Athens, and it was one of the first concerts I saw, and I was totally blown away with a trombone player because um, he had beautiful solos and he was dancing and I fell in love with the trombone and I convinced my parents, it was hard to convince them to, to start trombone lessons because trombone is not a popular instrument in Greece like it is here, you don't hear it in uh, Greek music. Um, yeah, the only place you might hear it is usually in funerals. <laughs> so <laughs> they were a little worried about me, but I convinced them. They saw that I was very, uh, I loved it so much. So yeah, that was what inspired me to, to play the trombone. And of course, actually, uh, I started trombone lessons like for two months. And uh, two months later, I happened to be in New York and with my family. And uh, my dad So. Uh, poster outside Lincoln Center uh, of a brass group. So he thought, oh, that's great. Since my son is playing trombone, we should all get tickets and go. And it was the Canadian brass with the uh, New York Philharmonic. <laughs> so that was actually a concert that really inspired me. Did Wonderful. you pay for those tickets, by the way? I did pay. Okay, good. I just <laughs> Full price? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my dad. Well, for all of those of you online and here in the house, thank you so much for joining us for this outstanding question and answer <laughs> se session with the Canadian Brass. And to the Canadian Brass, thank you for a wonderful performance. Um, we need to let them have a little dinner. They have another show this evening here at the Great Lakes Center for the Arts. But thank you very much for inspiring the next generation of musicians. And Great. keep practicing, keep networking is what I hear. Yep. Uh, follow your passion and just enjoy what you're doing. And thank you so very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.